Back in 2005, the Boston Bruins would make a blockbuster trade that would leave the league stunned as they would make one of the worst trades in NHL history as they would trade Joe Thornton for what ended up basically being one for one for Marco Sturm as this trade would also become the first and only trade that involved the MVP of that season, which would lead to the longest playoff drought since the 1960s. Yep, an entire two seasons. However, by 2011, the effects of this trade were irrelevant, as the Boston Bruins would cause a paradigm shift, as they would show that you could pull your way to a Stanley Cup. Peverly has a step to the net. Peverly, a big shot, and he scores! Peverly in alone! A chance for Mason Wade to cut it in! Almost stopped by Thomas! Kicked it on back. The net still empty, dropping back as BX has a goalie. Marsh on the shot, he scores! The Boston Bruins have won the Stanley Cup. And they pour on to celebrate with Tim Thomas, their heroic goaltender. And throughout the next decade, the Bruins would make two more finals appearances where we would see some crushing defeats. Well, for a lot of fans, it was a great time, but to the Bruins and their fan base, it was heartbreaking. In 2022, with nearly the same core that we saw back in 2011, the Bruins would shatter the Montreal Canadiens record, a record that has stood for 45 years as they would put up an astonishing 65 wins, 135 points in a season where many fans doubted they would even make the playoffs. And heading into this season, the Bruins would receive even more doubt with the loss of David Krejci, Patrice Bergeron, yet, and I'm not even joking, they are off to an even better start than last season as they are currently on pace for 140, 150 points. Because here's the thing, since their 2011 Cup win, aside from a few other teams, we are looking at a completely different league. We've seen teams go into rebuilds, become contenders, only to go into another rebuild. All in the same time, the Boston has continued a path of complete and utter dominance. In fact, from 1968 until 1997, the Boston Bruins wouldn't miss the playoffs once. Not only that, the Bruins are the only team in the league to have only had a playoff drought of a maximum of two seasons since the 60s. So the question is, how in the hell have the Boston Bruins stayed relevant? And why won't they just go away? Quick aside here, the guaranteed graded card box is now in stores where you're chasing a rookie, Kill McCarr Young Guns PSA 10. So check out the link down below. If a team has sustained relevance for nearly 60 years, you would have to assume that they have mastered the art that is retooling. A very high risk, hard to pull off strategy as the purpose of a rebuild is to strip away assets that won't help your team win in the future. Whether it's trading out veterans or trading away star players in attempt to change the identity of the team. A rebuild has one goal in mind. Lose enough to gain high-end draft picks and use those picks to draft building block players. Because if we take a look at a distribution curve of a first round pick, the proof is in the pudding. This graph, made by Yoki Nevalainen, highlights this exact phenomenon. The y-axis shows the odds a player will play 100 games. The x-axis shows the draft position. And as we can see by pick number 5, the odds a player suits up for 100 games drops by nearly 20%. And by the end of the first round, the odds drop by over 60%. Playing 100 games is by no means an indicator of a franchise player, as there's been many borderline NHL players who have played several hundred games. So the fact that we are seeing this dramatic of a drop off truly highlights the importance of drafting high when in need for those franchise players. Yes, drafting depth is crucial, but when it comes to constructing a roster, how are you gonna find a 60 goal player? Or maybe that number one defenseman? When it comes to adding depth, teams can slowly add through free agency, trades. So with that being said, how is Boston managed in the drafting department? On this graphic, 
We have the Bruins first round picks from 2012 until 2022. And here are the players who have had significant roles on the team. David Pasternak, Jake DeBrusque, and Charlie McAvoy. And as we can see, honestly, not that impressive in terms of consistency. The Bruins have been the definition of boomer bust drafters, as they either hit home runs or strike out. With that being said, they would still manage to draft two franchise players within the mid to late first round, which cannot be said about many teams, if any. And if we go back further in the timeline, what's even more bizarre is that the Bruins have had far more success after the first round. Patrice Bergeron and Brad Marchand are two future Hall of famers selected in the second and third round not to mention guys like lucic maybe not lucic right now jeremy swayman who's looking like a future vesna winner brandon carlo a six foot six defenseman mutant matthew petra in 2022 who's looking like a hidden gem in the making so what about top 10 picks this is where things get even more bizarre on this list, we have Boston's top 10 draft picks from 1997 until today. Okay, do you notice a weird trend? Jumbo Joe, Kessel, Sagan, Dougie Hamilton would all develop into stars. Yet, they would all be traded away. Not to mention that all these trades would end up being horrible for the Bruins. Put these trades on the same graphic and you get the picture. The fact that these trades didn't end up being a disaster for the Bruins is beyond me. But overall, I would give the drafting a 9.5. But if they're not retaining many of these players and end up flipping them for a far lesser return, what in the hell is happening? When it comes to professional sports, Boston is the city of champions. Whether it's football, basketball, baseball, hockey, Boston has the reputation of a winning city for good reason. And this right here is a large factor in the Bruins sustaining success. as their devotion into buying into systems on top of world-class leadership has led them to being the most consistent team in hockey. But it's not just about inspiring players to commit to the process. No, it's been about finding the right personnel. Even if you're a star player, Boston has shown time after time that they will cut ties if they think you don't have the right mindset. As the Bruins didn't like Thornton's playoff performances, thus, they would ship him out. Tyler Sagan was a young superstar on the rise. He was even a part of their 2011 Cup run. Yet, problems with missing team meetings, showing up late to practice, would result in a nothing burger return for the Bruins. Phil Kessel had a similar treatment. Dougie Hamilton, who was a 6'6 right-handed shot defenseman, who at the time was showing Norris upside, was traded away for a first and two seconds. Like seriously, imagine trading away a 6'6 right-handed shot defenseman in today's game. So let's think about this for a second. The Boston Bruins would trade away two number one centers, a first line winger, and a number one right shot defenseman. All of these positions have become nearly impossible to fill, and they would do this to maintain that strong culture. If you can't cut it, you're cut. And when you consider that this team was led by Chara, Patrice Bergeron, Brad Marchand, three players who mean business, the Bruins would rather have far lesser players, knowing that their leadership and culture creates a cohesive system. This mentality has led to the Bruins always punching above their weight class. And we are once again in the era of high-flying offense. And that offense has led to high event hockey. Yes, you may be scoring a lot, but if you're letting in just as many goals, it defeats the purpose, which has shown the importance of committing to playing winning hockey. This notorious Darnell Nurse play is the embodiment of how not to play winning hockey. As the Oilers would go on a 5-on-3 rush against Vancouver, Darnell Nurse is the last guy in, Cody CC and all three forwards are ahead of him, and if Nurse was truly committed to playing in a system, he would simply curl back to prevent a potential 2-on-0. However, he commits the offense. It's all the way over now, 2-on-0 for the Canucks all of a sudden. Pedersen a pass, a shot, and a goal! The shot wraps around the board, and Vancouver scores. Darnell Nurse is a defenseman. Play defense, man! As a team committed to a system and winning culture would never take this risk. If a defenseman pinches, they will ensure a forward is back. If a player is committed to a system, they will never make a pass through the slot to exit their zone. And if Lester Quinn Hughes or Kale McCarr, players should never walk the blue line 5-on-5. Five five. When these simple rules are strictly followed, defensive breakdowns become rare. And some people don't fully comprehend the role of a head coach. This right here is their role. 
establish fundamental rules to prevent the possibility of a breakdown through some of the examples I just mentioned. But at the same time, this is where it becomes a balancing act. If your rules are too strict, it can take away creativity and scoring upside of star players. So as a coach, you need systems that first and foremost focus on defense with the upside of allowing high danger scoring chances. This right here is a winning mindset. And to prove that the Bruins are the embodiment of this mindset, let's take a look at this graph. As right here, we have Boston's goals for and goals against from 2014 until today. From 2015 to 2017, they would enter a retooling phase, which in turn would cause their differential to drop. But one thing is clear from this visual. The Bruins have always been committed to a defense-first mindset, as their goals against hasn't directly correlated to their drops in goal scoring. Whereas, if we take a look at the Maple Leafs, a team fans constantly accused for not playing winning hockey, we do in fact get a different story. Now, keep in mind, these teams have been in completely different situations. In 2021, the Leafs would have a respectable year in terms of their defensive structures. The next season, they would record at an absurdly high 3.8 goals per game. But at the same time, they would also allow nearly half a goal more per game. And just last season, the Leafs would have their best season in terms of this differential. And by no coincidence, they would just so happen to have their deepest playoff run in decades. But the point is, even when Boston has lost young building block players, their commitment to both ends of the ice has led them to being the most consistent team in hockey. This is where team culture reaches a new level. When the salary cap was first introduced after the lockout, it would become much harder to create depth as teams around the league would begin to have gaping holes in their roster. Except one team, the Boston Bruins. As they would lock up Brad Marchand in his prime for eight years, 6.125 million, after winning three Selkie trophies in his previous four seasons. On top of career highs in goals and points, Percheron could have easily been one of the highest paid players in the league. Yet, this man would sign for eight years at 6.875 million. Between just these two players, we are talking about four to five million in annual savings against the cap. And when it comes to contracts, I've even heard fans question whether or not there is foul play happening. How can a team constantly lock up players far below their market value? It doesn't make sense. But here's the thing, when your franchise is built upon a winning culture, it actually makes a lot of sense. And when your leaders are showing the young players that taking slight discounts can lead to overall team success, it creates a culture that gets passed down to the next generation. If most guys on the team are taking one, two million dollar discounts, hell, even 500k, all of a sudden, your team has an extra 10, 20 million in cap space per season. With that being said, players will not take pay cuts if the team isn't winning. Hell, when David Pasternak signed his deal, I would hear the sentiment, finally, the Boston Bruins broke down and paid market price. And from face value, I get what you're saying, 11.25 million is a lot of money. But we are talking about a 60 goal scorer, locked up for the entirety of his prime, as I am positive that this contract will look like a steal in a couple years with a rising salary cap reminiscent of the dry settle contract we see today. If Pasta wanted, he could have signed for, you know, 13 million, but he would choose to take a little less to ensure the success of the team. You can't get upset at players for getting paid. You can, however, get mad at the GMs. <clears throat> Ken Holland, but not the players. It makes me respect the hell out of players who prioritize winning over making a little more on a yearly basis. This is the same mindset we would see in Pittsburgh. And to no surprise, they were contenders for over a decade. This right here is a Maple Leafs fans. What? You know what? Not, not even gonna finish that. So whether it's been great drafting, a winning culture that elevates every player on the roster, which in turn leads to contract bargains, all this is equal to a team that will never quit and won't go away. As a Canucks fan, why won't you go away? Which has resulted in the most dominant seasons in NHL history. But with that, are the Bruins a cup favorite this season? If not, who is? And have you ever witnessed a more dominant team? The Leafs pack is still in stock? Where you are chasing some amazing cards such as this awesome Matthews Young Guns. Or perhaps the guaranteed McDavid pack and the guaranteed Canucks Auto pack. And as always, thanks for watching.